At first it was just supposed to be an open letter of concern, asking questions, but in the middle of writing my letter, I impulsively wrote down my hunger strike. Tonight, a Cree mother makes a statement against a mega project in Quebec. Thank you everyone for everything you've done. Saying goodbye to National Hockey League legend Fred Sasakamoose. It's paramount for survival and for the survival of our people. And a mission to save a language in a community with less than 20 fluent speakers remaining. Good evening, welcome to APTN National News. I'm Melissa Ridgen. We begin in Chassassabie, Quebec, where a young mother of seven is protesting a multi-billion dollar development project. And as Jamie Pashagumskum reports, the woman is on her eighth day of a hunger strike. Ça va nous permettre aussi de mettre en valeur l'énorme potentiel minier du nord du Québec, tout en préservant l'environnement. The deal was signed in February and will see the construction of a seaport and rail line to support mining projects in the Cree territory. One of the nine Cree communities affected by the deal is the Cree nation of Sasibi. House and a group of Sasibi youth are against the project. At first it was just supposed to be an open letter of concern, asking questions, but in the middle of writing my letter I impulsively wrote down my hunger strike so uh, it was out of impulse and instinct i guess i'm not sure how said she wants better consultation with the cree nation youth and elders for the past eight days of her hunger strike house has been sustaining herself on the broth of caribou fish and today she's drinking ptarmigan broth one aspect of concern to sesame residents is that house is currently breastfeeding her four-month-old baby I've talked to elders. They said um, there's a lot of nutrients in broth. There's a lot of mute nutrients in caribou um, bone marrow or any kind of animal bone marrow when you make the broth and drink it and learn how to make it. There's a lot of nutrients there and our, our people survived on a lot less a long time ago and their children were fine. House said she was contacted yesterday by Grand Chief of the Cree Nation, Abel Bozum, where she told him her demands. That's when he told me it's a non-binding document, and that's when I asked him if it can be revised. The Grand Chief's office issued this statement. The Cree Nation government invites all points of view. It is the voices that call for the preservation of the land, the Cree way of life, and the protection of wildlife that will make our development strategy truly unique and balanced. House said she will keep up her hunger strike for as long as it takes. A Sasibi community meeting will be held Friday to discuss the mega project. Jamie Pashagumskum, APTN National News, Sasibi, Quebec. Joyce's principal, the Atikamik Nation's plan to improve health care isn't getting a passing grade from the Quebec government. The National Assembly is refusing to implement it fully, objecting again to the term systemic racism. Joyce's principal is named for Joyce Echequan, who died in a Joliet, Quebec hospital in late September. Liberal Party MNA Gregory Kelly's motion to adopt it officially fell flat on Wednesday. The document calls on Quebec to recognize its role fighting systemic racism. Indigenous Services Minister Ian Lafreniere says this only uh, that, that the only point uh, that is the only point that Quebec disputes. He says the rest of the plan is workable. Ceci étant dit, dans notre travail, dans l'approche qu'on a avec les Premières Nations, notre approche sur le terrain, on a déjà dit que ça prenait de la formation dans le milieu de la santé, on a déjà dit aussi que ça prenait des navigateurs. Et ce qu'on a reçu dans le principe de, de Joyce, ce qu'on a reçu de la part de la Nation Antikamek, ce sera des guides, ce sera des références pour nous, pour nous aider dans l'application de ce qu'on veut faire, qui pour nous est du très tangible, ça va nous permettre d'aider les Premières Nations, d'aider les gens sur le terrain de façon très pragmatique. Là encore une fois, on salue ce travail. Starting December 1st, masks will be mandatory in all indoor public places in the Yukon. In the past week, the territory reported 14 new cases of COVID-19, the highest number of confirmed cases since the pandemic began. 
Following the spike of cases in BC, the Yukon has now reintroduced COVID-19 control measures that include people entering the territory to quarantine for 14 days. We want to hear what you think about stepped up COVID measures. Here's how you can continue the conversation. You can send your emails to news at aptn.ca. Leave a comment on aptnnews.ca. You can also follow APTN News on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube, where you can share your comments. Fred Sasakamus uh, was a pioneer of the game of hockey, and his death on Tuesday was felt by many. With more, here's Daryl Stranger on the impact he had and the legacy that he leaves behind. Thank you, everyone, for everything you've done. The death of Fred Sasakamus from COVID-19 struck a chord, and many people took to social media to express their condolences. NHL teams, former players, politicians all expressed their grief for one of the first Indigenous players in NHL history. Steve Hogel is the former Saskatoon Blades president and was a friend of Sasakamus. Uh, wherever I went with him or if I was having a coffee with him, people would come up and talk to him and... You just had to love the way he rolled, and uh, he always put others first. And and um, even though he had he had led this legendary life and had created such an amazing history, he was always about looking forward and thinking about that younger generation and taking care of the kids. So uh, he sets a wonderful example for us, uh, and and will forevermore. Sasakamus was a residential school survivor who grew up in Atakakup Cree Nation in Saskatchewan. He made his NHL debut November the 20th, 1953, against the Boston Bruins as a member of the Chicago Blackhawks. After hockey, he started a national hockey championship to allow Indigenous hockey athletes to showcase their talents. He also became a band counselor of his home Atakakoop Cree Nation, serving many years and spent six years as chief. In 2017, Sasakamus was invested in the Order of Canada, an honour that recognizes Canadian citizens for outstanding achievement, dedication to community, or service to the nation. He, he believed in his, uh, in his culture, his language, his people. He believed in us getting along with uh, non-native people, races around the world. Uh, he, he believed in a lot of good qualities of what we should be striving for. He inspired many Indigenous hockey players after him, such as Manitoba's Reggie Leach, among others. Fred Sasakamus was 86 years old. Daryl Stranger, APT National News, Winnipeg. Wishing him a safe journey, and our hearts are certainly with those who are grieving his loss. Well, we have to take a break, but still ahead, saving languages that are nearly extinct in the Yukon. I was inspired by smoke signals, Chief Leonard George on smoke signals he does a, a road report and it's hilarious with most indigenous languages in the yukon facing extinction our perspective series on language revitalization takes a look at how one first nations community is using an immersive program to develop language fluency. And as Sarah Connors tells us, the results have been promising. There's few cars in Hangs Junction, but as the man behind these traffic reports will tell you, every word is a word worth speaking. Kasha is from Champagne and Ajak First Nation and makes road reports in his ancestral language of Southern Toshone. It's a humorous and informative way to preserve a language that's rapidly vanishing. He says the inspiration came from a comedic source. In time for the weather report. Lester here. One of the clouds up there looks like a horse. I was inspired by smoke signals chief leonard george on smoke signals he does a, a road report and it's hilarious kashaw makes the videos as part of an effort to help preserve southern toshone right now there's fewer than 20 speakers in the community it's why kashaw has made it his mission to pass on the language so that it may be preserved for future generations so my vision is very clear on what i'm doing it's paramount for survival and for the survival of our people. 
Kasha grew up as Stephen Reed. No one in his family besides his grandmother spoke Southern Toshone. It wasn't until university that he truly realized how few people the spoke their traditional language. And that summer I went home and I looked at the community and I, and I was wondering where are the younger speakers. Since then, Kasha has earned a degree in education and a master's in language revitalization and has been teaching himself and others a language on the brink of extinction. Uh, now 41 years old and going by his traditional name, Kasha describes himself as moderately proficient and for the last three years has been teaching a one-of-its-kind immersive language program to a group of eight students. He says it's those who want to see their tradition carried on that's compelled him to do the work. It started with a vision. Um, so just like my mind tells my hand what to do, the ancestors tell me what to do, and I'm the working hand of the ancestors. Mm. Something is okay. big. Okay. Okay. Mm. The full day classes heavily focus on speaking. <laughs> Eventually, some students will even pass on the language to children at a local daycare. Kasha says the results are promising. What? Our younger students are, are hungry for the language. It's redirected their lives. A lot of the things that is is being uh, transmitted to the students is our is the teachings. Sheila Kushnaruk is one of the oldest students and works at the First Nations Cultural Center. She's learning the language to enhance her interpretive work, but there's also another reason. When I was growing up, I didn't have the chance. Now I can understand what Grandma was teaching us. The First Nations invested $1 million into the program so students like Kushnaru can attend classes without worrying about finances. Now she plans on passing on what she's learned to the next generation, something she never thought she'd be able to do. And that way there, when I'm talking to my grandkids, my, I can understand what they're asking me, the questions. <laughs> Today, elders Lorraine Allen and Audrey Brown are showing students how to make gopher sticks. A few days a week, the elders attend class and reinforce the language by teaching cultural practices like these that most students haven't had the opportunity to learn. They say they can still remember a time when only indigenous languages were spoken. I never forget my language. As my mom speaks northern, southern Toshone, and my dad speaks northern Toshone, so I speak both of them. Their dream is that the language will be passed on through these teachings. We're happy that uh, students are, their progress is, is quicker than we thought. While the program was only intended to run for two years, students requested a third to better hone in on the language. Next year, they'll graduate and a new group will come in. The class is so popular, there's now a wait list for prospective students. And what I'm really trying to foster is that this is lifelong. It, it has to be. Even three years isn't enough time. And it won't be an easy road ahead. As more elders pass on every year, the language goes with them. It's challenging that our numbers are so low. Um, it's challenging that our community is so small. Uh, but there's a lot more things that are pushing me down that path, and there are challenges. And while immersive programs like these are important, Kasha says indigenous languages can't only exist in the classroom. They need to be part of everyday speaking, like its traffic reports. But Kasha says if First Nations invest in preserving their languages, there is hope for the next generation. My ultimate goal would be that my grandchildren never have to learn Southern Dishoni, that they just become speakers of it. It doesn't have to be something they have to dedicate their life to like I've had to. It's just something that they can have. Sarah Connors, APTN National News, Hangs Junction. Well, it's time for another break, but when we come back, improving snail mail service in the north. We have communities in this country that have uh, 3,000 people, 3,000 members, and they've never had a post office.
Welcome back. It's time now for our photo of the day. This was sent to us by Corinne Mecredi. She is, it's a gorgeous uh, glimpse of Canada's eighth largest lake, Lake Athabasca in northern Saskatchewan. Keep those great pictures coming. We love your scenery, your cute kids, interesting snapshots from the land. Send your photo to share at aptn.ca and you might see your photo as our next photo of the day. Time now for a look at tomorrow's weather forecast. To the east coast, we've got six with a mix of sun and cloud in Charlottetown, 10 and rain for Halifax. Kujuak minus eight and snow Nain, sunshine and minus seven. Quebec City snow in two degrees, sunny with minus three and sunny skies. Toronto, 10 and showers, five and showers for Ottawa. Cap is casing two degrees in a mix of sun and cloud, two and snow for Wawa. Minus 12 in snow for Churchill, God's Lake, minus four. Zero in snow for Winnipeg and Brandon, minus one in snow for Dauphin. Regina, minus three in snow, minus one in rain in uh, Fort Battleford, or North Battleford, minus seven, Buffalo Narrows, and some snow, minus 13 in snow for Stony Rapids. Sunshine in three degrees for Grand Prairie, one in snow for Peace River. Edmonton, sunny and two degrees, three in rain for Lethbridge. Vancouver, nine in showers, sunshine in three for Quinnell. Prince George, snow in three degrees, same with Smithers, minus three in snow for Dees Lake. Minus eight in sunshine for Whitehorse, Dawson City, minus 11 in snow. Wrigley, minus 13 in snow, Norman Wells, minus 15 in snow. Inuvik, mix of sun and cloud, minus 21. Polytech, minus 17 and sunny. Baker Lake, minus 25 and snow. New Yacht, uh, minus 22 and snow. Igloo Lake, minus 20 and sunny skies. Tally Oak, minus 28 and clear. Minus 22 and cloud for Clyde River. Last week, Canada Post unveiled its new Indigenous and Northern Reconciliation Strategy that will improve service to communities in the Northern Territories. Northern communities can expect improvements like new full-service post offices, parcel lockers, and better access to banking services. The Crown Corporation says it will hire more Indigenous workers and will also try to stop the flow of illegal substances like drugs and alcohol. We have communities in this country that have uh, 3,000 people, 3,000 members, and they've never had a post office. And we've got to ask ourselves why that is. So we're going back and addressing that community by community. We have a great interest across the country to engage that. Wakwemakam First Nation, located on Manitoulin Island, Ontario, is answering calls to help the fight against COVID-19. The community has just begun producing a personal protection equipment. The project was made possible through a new partnership with a medical equipment manufacturer. Joining us now to talk about the new endeavor is Chief Duke Pelche. Welcome to you, Chief Pelche. So tell us about the new partnership to produce PPE. Well, the, uh, we've uh, just recently completed our industrial park here in the community. And as uh, word got out that we have uh, space available for uh, corporate ventures and partnerships, uh, we were approached by First Nation Procurement Incorporated. And they have a uh, partnership with Dentex Canada to produce uh, personal protective equipment and um, and namely their, their flagship uh, product, the FN95 uh, respirator that's uh, going to be available and produced here in our, in our community. And what does it mean to your community? Well, it's a very substantial amount of employment opportunities where they're welcoming um, 50 individuals to, uh, for long-term sustainable jobs that are very well-paying uh, manufacturing positions. and. Um, this is uh, akin to a city receiving uh, two or 3,000 employees, uh, so it's uh, quite significant. This is amazing news, and how soon will the facility be running at full capacity then? Well, they're uh, still, they are producing currently, and uh, they expect to be at full capacity uh, by the mid-December. You said these are long-term jobs. Is this a permanent endeavor? Yes, uh, they uh, had signed an agreement for five years of uh, renting the building, the facility that we have. So uh, we, we uh, estimate that uh, as long as there's pandemic and there's a need uh, for masks, and uh, I believe that some of the contracts that, they, that have been secured were for medical facilities, so it is definitely long term. Well, thank you for taking the time to share this with us, and congratulations. This is great news for your community for sure. Thank you very much for uh, spreading the word and um, uh, thank you.
Indigenous Fashion Week Toronto kicks off tomorrow, and so it seemed appropriate that today we put our fashion and glam in focus. What we wear is something that we should all put more thought into, not just to be more stylish, but stylish, but to be less destructive to the planet while supporting sustainable clothing and, if possible, our own designers. And there are some little ones that you would um, also want to support. Here's some highlights from today's In Focus. Our clothing, is there's much more than just what we choose to wear. Mm -hmm. um, it really goes into the environment, the protection of the environment, um, the way people are treated, the way that we represent our cultures. Mm -hmm. um, so when you make that decision, when you're getting dressed this in the morning, um, think about how what was the impact on the environment? Um, if it was made locally, if the fur or leather was hunted locally, or if it was mass farmed, um, where the way the fabric is dyed, um, and then also just the the overall ethical thoughts around like representation of culture. Mm -hmm. And so these are the kinds of things we really should be thinking about when we're putting, when we're getting dressed in the morning. And that goes down to making more um, conscious consumer decisions, like thinking about who made my clothing, mm -hmm. who made the very fibers. And I think we could also do more to make the connection that indigenous fashion, you know, gets us back on our land. It gets us working with elders, working with knowledge holders. Um, like the supply chain that goes into making indigenous fashion um, is so community focused and it, it, it's so supportive of our goals for cultural resurgence, language revitalization. Like you need all of those pieces working harmoniously to get indigenous fashion. Uh, and I think there's things that we could just do to discourage you no know, fast fashion consumption. Mm -hmm. um, there's no reason why you need, you know, a new outfit every month or you need to be keeping up with seasonal trends. Like, um, I, um, this is a cocoon material and I love scrunchies. Um, and then put that together and made a cocoon scrunchie. <laughs> Um, you're Algonquin. How do, does, does your culture factor into your scrunchie designs, aside from obviously the cook'em scarf? Um, the cook'ems would used to wear the uh, the, co the cook em scarves on their heads if they would go outside. Cook'emscrunchies.ca is where you can get those scrunchies. Now there's another way to get your Indigenous news coverage. We're on TikTok. We've recently joined the popular video sharing platform. Take a look at our first post. CNN categorized a race of voters as something else during live coverage of the American election results. Indigenous people on either side of the medicine line took the label to mean them. The internet did the rest. But the reaction wasn't all satirical. Many took serious issue with the coverage, pointing out the colonial implications of the something else label, saying it erases and minimizes indigenous people's impact on the political landscape of the United States. CNN told APTN News that the poor choice of words has since been corrected. Next time, they'll hopefully think of something else to use in their news graphics. You can follow us on tiktok.com slash APTN News for more. Well, lots of great designers and great discussion about what, uh, how changing what we wear. That was the episode of In Focus today. If you missed it, it's on the APTN News Facebook page, or you can go to our website, aptnnews.ca slash In Focus. Find it there. We're all out of time for tonight. I'm Melissa Ridgen. Have a great night. We'll be back here tomorrow.